Okay, good morning everybody. <clears throat> We're getting ready to go uh, do our weekly Bible study message called Riding on Course with Scott Mendes. So we're waiting for a few of you folks to jump on here this morning. Uh, coming to you from Western Harvest Fellowship Center in Weatherford. Let's see if we can get a couple of you guys on here real quick. And then we've got a great study for us this morning. So praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Glad that you could be with us. We're going to allow everybody to get on here maybe uh, and do a little sound check as usual each week. Um, then we'll go over some prayer requests and get started with our teaching. So if you're watching this, um, you know how we like to do it. Maybe have your Bible out, take some notes on some scripture reference, and then uh, also just turn it up if you're outside working. We've got people that watch from driving tractors and pulling calves all over the nation. So uh, we're real excited. Thank you guys for tuning in this morning. I'm excited about what we want to share on. Man, we've been burning up the highways. I just wanted to jump in here this morning real quick uh, in the Fellowship Center and uh, bring the Word of God and uh, help us to grow and to equip each other and to strengthen one another. So we're getting ready to start here in just a second. Allowing a few folks to jump on here. Praise the Lord. Hope you guys had a great week. I pray that what we minister on today will encourage you for the week ahead. Amen. So, uh, good morning, Brett and Jesse, all you guys, thank you for being on here, and uh, God is good. So, what I want to do is we want to open up in prayer, and then at the end of this message, I'll give you guys a little housekeeping information about how to partner, and some of our schedule and so forth. So, I'm Scott Mendes with Western Harvest Ministries. We do a weekly Bible study called Riding on Course, and it's always a blessing and an honor. We come to you a lot from the pickup, different facilities, rodeos, wherever we may be in our travels. And uh, what we really want to do is to put God's Word into your family, into your heart, uh, with simple application to help you guys to grow spiritually. It's so important that we understand God's Word, that we're in love with it, that it has first place in our life. And so these, these studies that we just pulled together are just really fundamental scriptures and uh, as you meditate on the Word of God, then all your ways will be successful in God's eyes. And so we try to always determine in the flesh what is the world and what is the spirit, what is natural, what is eternal, uh, all those things. There's cause and effects to everything we do from our thoughts to our action to the intents of our heart. So I don't want to give away this morning's message, but as you guys know, uh, <clears throat> let's pray and lift up our ranching community in Amarillo with the fires. Uh, it's incredibly overwhelming what's happened, um, you know, with the, with that going on up there. There's a lot of resources and supplies going up there. Just, you know, we all need to do what we can do. And if you can't do anything else, just pray. If you can send materials, um, you know, that's great. But let's stand together this morning as we pray. We're going to teach God's word, and then we ask you to share this with as many folks as you can, like it, share it, do all those things, just to help it get out there. Um, and, and that's why we do it, is that more people will hear it. So we're thankful for your partnership. We know that everybody that's watching this has needs in their life and uh, desire to grow in their relationship and their covenant with God. And uh, when we stand together, we'll see those things happen. And so it's very important that we don't allow this new form of Jesus, this new one world, you know, government and religion, those type of things to try to overtake what the God, what God's word says in his Bible. And so if you're needing breakthroughs spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, relationships, God is waiting. And so we're going to press into God together this morning. Amen. Will you pray with me this morning as we stand in agreement with our brothers and sisters in the Amarillo area and around this nation? Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you. Father, we thank you that you are a good God. Father, you are merciful. Lord, you are awesome. And so, Father, as we praise you, as we worship you, we give ourselves as surrendering to your authority to govern our life individually, our families, everything. Lord, our finances, our physical healing, Lord God. I pray right now with so much evil, so much demonic uh, influence over our life, Lord, that we would just 
be strong, that we would have discernment, that we would speak to our flesh according to your scriptures that are holy, that are pure, and are powerful over our life. And Father, where you send your word, you said it would not return back void. And so I thank you this morning as we minister in the word, Lord, you will send your word as we agree, as two or three agree as touching anything on this earth. It shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so today, Father, we stand with those that are affected by these fires, ranchers, farmers, livestock, resources, homes, destinies. Uh, Father, we just pray that you would bless them, that you'll help them to put those fires out, Lord God, to rebuild, uh, to have what they need, Father, to show the love of brothers and sisters, not only kindly brotherly love, but, Father, your love, eternal love, that there's people willing to get outside of themselves and to offer service, whatever that may be. And, Father, I pray for our partners that watch this physical healing, spiritual, emotional healing, Lord God, uh, direction and purpose and identity, to use our gifts, Lord, to use our calling to serve you. So I thank you, Father, that whatever we're overseeing, that you blessed our life with, that we surrender it back to you. And we, Father, we put principles to action and faith to action. And Lord, that we would be strong in our minds, in our physical body, our mind, our will, and our emotion, our soul, and our spiritual man will stand in agreement with heaven above. Father, as you come back for us in the days ahead, let us be ready. But until then, let us be effective, not busy, but fruitful, Lord God, to share your word, to introduce others to you, Jesus, Yeshua, our Father above, Lord, that will help people to grow and to break through whatever it is that they need in their life. So we thank you this morning as we pray that the word of God will change us and we'll be uh, pressing into what you called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Lift up our government, our country, our military. There's so many places to pray. And I, I can tell you right now, probably many of you even in, in listening to me pray know that uh, it's been a long week already um, traveling up and down the highways. But we're back home for this morning and uh, wanted to get right into God's word. So those things that I want to share on. Good morning, Julie. Uh, I don't have any monitors with me just coming to you uh, this way. And so I can't really interact with you guys a lot. But I pray that as we stand in agreement, what I want to speak on this morning will really, really bless you. A lot of these scriptures, I, I in the, you know, when I have time, I will cut them out and go over them. But this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. And what I want to talk about this week, I believe, will be something that's really good. As you know, each week when we're putting these messages together, the Lord will just quicken my spirit, my heart. And what I want to talk to you this morning is about is how do we feel an empty heart. I see so many people in the world that we live, they're just, they're empty spiritually. And that, they may have great resources, they may have great legacies, they may have all kinds of earthly possession, monetarily speaking. Uh, they have all this stuff going on on the outside, but you just look into the eyes, the soul, deep into their eyes, and you listen to them speak, and you can tell that they really are you know, empty on the inside. And, and so I want to talk to us about the heart. I love talking about the heart because that, that's kind of just the ministry I have and the things that I've gone through in my relationship with the Lord is, is Lord, use me um, uh, to your benefits, to your glory. And, and, and in order to do that, it, it's really about motives. It's about our heart. It's about renewing our mind. And so this message this morning, as we go through it um, and share these scriptures, I believe it'll really bless you. Maybe you're watching this today. And, and you do, you're empty spiritually, uh, even in the midst of a lot of people around you, your husbands and wives and families and, and, and big sporting events and, and rodeos. And you just, you just know on the inside that God sees who you really are, although the people around you see you as a different way. And, and, and it, you know, I'm not talking about suicide. It can come to that point, you know, giving up your life when God loves you. And so as we look at the word of God this morning, we're going to see how do we feel an empty heart, spiritually comparing the word of God to the physical person that we are here watching today. Amen. All right. I'll try to watch my time here. You guys help me out a little bit with that. Um, it, it's challenging. So we're going to use a foundational scripture Matthew 12, verses 43 through 45. 
Matthew 12, 43 through 45. Check this out. This is really good passage of scripture. It says, when a unclean spirit goes out of a man or a woman, I always add that in there as you know my teaching style, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house for which I have come. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, put into order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. As we know, the Lord spoke in parables to his disciples and he compared things in those times that he lived. And he is a real person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Jesus is a person. God the Father is a spirit of love. And he manifests to us in a certain way. So as we read this this morning, comparing an empty heart, how do we feel it? And as we see right here, let's go over some of that. We find that Jesus described the spiritual conditions of the generation of his day. Well, he's talking to you and I. The word of God is effective, alive, and well, sharper than any two-edged sword for Jesus's time and for our time. And that is when people approach with wrong doctrine. They think that this Bible is a book of fairy tales or that that was for them, not for us. No, it's for us today. And when we read this word, we see that Jesus cast out evil spirits from people and he's comparing it saying that when he was rejected he left but if that house is not refurnished or replenished the heart being the house being our heart we can compare uh, compare that today when you don't fill it back up with something it's empty and the devil wants to come back in so just because you have uh, been delivered from demonic spirits or bad relationships or bad accounts in your life you've got to fill it back up your heart that we're talking about this morning the house of god you need to spend times with your eyes on the things above, renewing your mind to God's word. And when you do that, we will understand. So if we backed up just a couple of verses, Matthew 12, stay right there. Verse 38 and 39 says this, just to bring forth our foundational scripture. Verse 38 of Matthew 12 says, Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, some translations say master, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he says in verse 39, he says, But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to him except that the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, I don't want to get off track here, but I'm telling you, of this coming year, we have a solar eclipse coming in on April 8th. It's amazing as you break it down. And, and the significant symbols of what God is talking about in, in the skies and on the earth today. And, and he said right here that one of the signs would be that of Jonah. Where did Jonah go? Jonah went to Nineveh. And in Nineveh is some of the tracking of the course that uh, the solar eclipse is going to take place in just a month. Miracles. It's been seven years, uh, 2017, since we had this eclipse. And I know it's all over the internet, but my brothers and sisters, just study it and believe that God is showing us a sign. And, and what does it mean? Back in those times uh, uh, abroad, there was civil war and there was change. And on the day eight, what does eight mean? Eight means new beginnings. And so this country has been given an opportunity to repent of taking God out of his place. And when good people do nothing, then we get bad effects. And so today we're talking about filling our heart as furniture, uh, furnishing it with, 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 with good things. Once the, the devil has been evicted from your heart, you're, you, you've been saved, uh, but you're not growing spiritually. And so that's what we want to look at. So we want to grow. It's, it's not good enough to be saved and be baptized and then sit down. Let the preacher do all the work. Let him teach you. No, you got to bring it in and have application and verify what you're being taught, especially in these times where revelation is rolling forward in new manners because it's been reserved and hidden for such a time as this. The word of God is powerful. Let's go on. So we see that even in Jesus' time, there was a wicked and adulterous generation. There's a wicked and adulterous generation as well. We also describe how 
they would be condemned by Nineveh and the Queen of Sheba and the day of judgment. That's going a little bit on to verse 41 and verse 42. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let's go ahead and read it. So we pretty much have read Matthew 12, 38 through uh, 45, but let's go ahead and read uh, this part of it. Uh, 20, 38, 39, we just read that uh, about the evil, evil and adulterous generation. Uh, verse 40, let me go ahead and read it. For as Jonah was there three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days, in the three days and nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment of this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed greater than Jonah is here. And then it talked about the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear wisdom, uh, the wisdom of Solomon and indeed greater than the Solomon is here. So we're talking about Jesus and we see this uh, in this passage. Uh, one thing I want to talk about even last night traveling, picking up some horses from down south was uh, people don't realize that Nona was, uh, Nona, excuse me, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And so we remember the stories we were taught in Sunday schools, but we need to break down the scriptures farther. Jonah gave 40 days when he went to Nineveh. God helped him to get there. And I pray that we don't have to go through the belly of a fish to not answer the call of God on our life like Jonah did. But God will do whatever he needs to do to get your attention. And he's got the attention of the American uh, of America today. The question is, what will the people do? The remnant believers, will we get out and be saved and sanctified and witness and glorify our Father and not compromise our value with this wicked and perverse generation? Now, if we will do that, we will be blessed and God will give us some time. Inevitably, time will run out. But we're not caught off a of guard what we see in our politics. We're not caught off a of guard with the uh, the evil agenda of AI and all these things that, you know, we really don't talk about, but we need to talk about them because they're prevalent in God's word. He's warning us is what I'm saying. How you uh, heed that warning is up to you and your family. But as for my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. And that's what you need to understand. So we see there's a lot of judgment in this present text, as we study and describe, we see an evil generation. That's just kind of an introductory to all this. Using the example of demon possession, Jesus warned, it is not enough to go through the process of having uh, our sins forgiven. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of flakiness out there. You can go to the Pentecostal, you can go to the whatever, and you see a lot of stuff about demonic deliverance. I'm here to tell you, demons are real. They're probably more real than the Martians you're being presented in your local news. And they have ordinances, they have jobs to do, they, they came from somewhere, they're going somewhere. And so what side of this do you want to believe the world and the science or you want to believe God in the scriptures? Demon positions, p possession people have no ability. Uh, uh, they, they have to be submitted to the things of God. Jesus rebuked them and cast them into the swine. They left, but they will come back. And that's what we're talking about. How do we fill an empty heart? If your heart is empty, let's fill it with the things of God, not the positive thinking or the sugar-coated churches that we find ourselves being uh, entertained by today. Let's get into the Word of God. So uh, it's not good enough just to have your sins forgiven. You need to grow. And as you grow, God will show you there's things we need to deal with. Maybe we need to rebuke, cast out, curse, and renew ourselves and eject the bad things. If it's possession or events or things that happen uh, in your life, you can overcome that by the power of God's Word. Amen. There's a lot of people that take it out of text, but it is real. And that's the deception. The, the, the enemy knows it's real, so he tries to pervert it and, and he offers counterfeits. Amen. I'm not presenting to you a Jesus of what they're presenting today in Super Bowl commercials. I am presenting to you the Jesus, God the Father, the Word, the King of Kings, Lord of Lord, uh, uh, Isaac, Jacob. And, and so on. So let's go on. I'm just getting ahead of myself a little bit. Unless reform, reformation continues and something positive is put into place, the end 
proves to be worse than the beginning. That's what he said. The state of this man shall be worse. He got saved. He got delivered of demonic possession, but he didn't fill his heart out. That's what I said. The devil will give you A and B or one and two. He doesn't want you to get three because that's a completion of a process. So God wants us to spiritually grow. How does he do that? By the things that we even offer in our ministry. God's plan for his disciples. Amen. You got to go through workbooks. You got to study. You got to break down the scriptures. Go through to be discipled. When you're discipled, God can reward and commission you to the calling that he has. Are you a pastor? Are you a teacher? Are you an evangelist? The service of helps. Whatever. God created you. And until you find what he created you for, you'll never be complete. And it's not good enough to be saved. That's why your heart is empty. You have to press in and apply action to the word of God. Uh, such has been the case for the Jews of Jesus's days forever. We see that there is an important lesson to be gleaned as we apply to uh, what we're talking about today. It, a feeling an empty heart. How do we do that? We're going to talk about that here really quickly. Uh, we will see um, there are plenty of distractions to keep us from that. That's what I mean from God's very best. we got to press in, and we've got to learn how to not just say yes to everything. We say no to a few things because it, it, it affects our core values. It affects what, what we're heading towards and, and who we are. And so we see that we must replace evil with good. What is good? God's word. He says, I will provide seed for the sower. So this scripture going into my mind, through my eyes, into my spirit, man, into my brain, into my thoughts, getting down into my soul will tell me the course that God has set me on. If you're just living as a slave and going to work and paying taxes and listening to the media and, and going home at the end of the day and being exhausted and saying, Lord, is there any more than this? I'm here to tell you there's a whole lot more than this. And we're just journeymen passing through well, once you know who you are in Christ in the spiritual realm. There is more of God's armies with us. Elijah, last week's teaching, we said that Elijah prayed for his uh, assistant to know that in the spiritual realm, God has horses and warriors and chariots and angels to battle on your behalf. So we shouldn't be weary and giving up. What happens is we drain ourselves in the world system, and then we give up and we're empty. And today we're talking about how to fill your heart with the things of God. Matthew 12, verse 43 and 35 is our foundational scripture. We're not going to read it again, but Jesus cast out a demon, a demon-possessed man. He got those demons, right? And then he says, if you don't fill your heart back up, the state of that, the demons will go and get seven of his brothers and come back. And that person will be worse off. And so we're talking today about that. What are some of the dangers of an empty heart? Listen to this. Just with the help of notes and the helps of uh, concordances we see, I want to write these down and we're going to talk about them quickly here. The dangers of an empty heart is like a home. Your heart is, is inside of you. It is the spirit of man. You have a spirit. You have a heart, which is your soul, your mind, will, and your emotion. And then you have a flesh. God breathed life, eternal life into your spirit. And he loves your soul and your heart. You, you must program those things so that your flesh cannot lead you astray to go after greedy, dirty money, to do things that, that are not uh, uh, in the characteristic of what a true remnant believer is. Child of God, we can't be in those dark places. We can't speak like the rest of the world. We cannot uh, uh, infringe and, and think that government is our answer and, 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 and fall into traps that are set before us in the media. And in this world that we live in. So your heart is like a home. It can, it can reside things and produce much harm. Let's look at Matthew 15. I'm going to stay right here in Matthew because in the Gospels there's so much. Let's look at Matthew 15 and verse 19. And it says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adultery, fornications, thefts, false witness and blasphemes. Well, where are your problems coming from? Maybe it's your own heart. Maybe you're saved and intellectually you think that you know about Jesus, but you don't know him in a relationship in your heart. And so we're led astray because we quit growing. We weren't discipled, right? So out of this, or proceed evil things. And Jesus is telling us that. That's the harm of having the wrong things in your heart. 
God wants to save you. God wants to clean your heart, but he expects you and I to do our part to fill the house. And when we fill the house, then we're on track with God, right? Amen. But it can also be a source of much good. As we read, you turn back a couple chapters to Matthew 12, and we see in verse 35, Matthew 12, 35 says this, A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. Now, if you've ever allowed me or heard me share my testimony in a public forum, I use these scriptures. They were foundational to me because God, I loved him so much in my heart as a child coming from insecurities and dysfunction and divorce and all the things that I went through in my childhood as a rodeo cowboy thinking winning a gold buckle was going to be the, the greatest thing to ever change me. It's gold buckles don't change nothing. What changes you is the power of God's word and a covenant relationship with him. But in that heart, I love God in my heart, but Romans 12, 2, as we'll see in a moment in this teaching, is what renewed my mind to God's word and gave me the confidence to know God is to know his word. And so there's evil that comes out of a heart of a man that hasn't been discipled, baptized into one Jesus, uh, in a relationship with Jesus. If you're in religion, you're doomed from the start. The end of your road will lead you to death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I hate religion, but I love relationship. I've seen what religion does. Religion kills Jesus. It mocks him. It twists him. It controls him. It sows into bad harvest. But the relationship of a good heart is a man that says, Lord, I need more of you. I yield to you and I want more. So we're talking about how to fill an empty heart. We see that where the heart is is where it starts. But the completion is we must fill it. And that's what we're talking about right now. Our house can be cleansed. Jesus promises you his power is greater than the power of the devil, demonic spirits, or this world. You can't love God and the world. Choose today and then be firm about it. No compromise. Conquer the beast of this world. It lies, it steals, and it will destroy your life if you give in to the flesh, if you give in to uh, unsound doctrine. If you don't know the signs of the times, you will be defeated. Hanging on to the past where Jesus said, my word and my anointing is fresh every day to overcome the giants and the circumstances in your life. Amen. Our heart is cleansed. And I'm asking every one of us to do that. Hebrews 10, 22. We'll just look at a couple scriptures here. Hebrews 10, uh, 22. And again, a lot of times I like to have these uh, already uh, pasted and ready to go. But if we look at Hebrews chapter 10 real quick and verse 22, uh, we'll verify that and move on to some other points of today's foundational teaching. Amen. Let's get over here to the book of Hebrews 10 and verse 22 says this. It says, let us draw near with a true heart. Well, why does God say that in his word? Is there an evil heart? Is there an immobilized heart, one that ain't moving, one that ain't growing, one that ain't studying God's word, one that's so busy that he doesn't have time to spend quality time with his father? So yes, there's all kinds of hearts to teach on. Today we're talking about filling an empty heart. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Washing of the Holy Spirit, washing of the Word of God changes us on the inside. The world wants to change you in your costumes, in your makeup, in your deception, your perceiving and deceiving others of thinking everything's fine. God judges your heart. Amen. Sometimes people have destroyed their looks. They may not ever be able to go back to who they were really intended to be, but God loves that heart. Amen. And so we need to love them as well. So let's go on. Uh, Acts 15, we'll turn back here just a little bit. I'm just trying to really prove this point. Acts 15, and we look at verses um, 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9, here we go. So God said, who knows the heart? Acknowledge them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did 
to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. The just shall live by faith. The, the, the just shall live by faith and not by sight alone, right? And so God is telling us, what is faith? It's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You're not going to see it all worked out as you walk in it. That's what the devil does. He says, well, if God wanted you to have that, he, he would prepare the way. You don't have anything to do in here. That's what hyper grace is. That is what replacement theology is. That is what error theology is. It's not about your better life. It's not about your kingdom impact. It's not about you making more money. It's about you surrendering to a loving God that will lead you to victory, which someday will be heaven. But right now it's in the battle of earth, good and evil. And so let's go on and talk about that. We're talking about the dangers of an empty heart. Amen. Our conscience is purged from dead works to serve God. Hebrews 9.14. Go ahead. We'll just keep flipping back and forth so you guys will understand. This isn't me saying this. This is foundational scriptures. Hebrews chapter 9. Let's drive these points home this morning so that we can understand if it's in God's word, it's for me. Hebrews 9 verse 14 says this right here. 914. We'll turn over here. Uh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleansed our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now you see that you're conscious. What is that? We can break that down in the rodeo world. Do we ride bulls in a conscious mind or in a subconscious mind? Subconscious mind reacts. Conscious mind has to think it out. But God right here has said he has cleansed our conscience, right? He's a loving God. He's a living God. And our conscience, we should have our mind stayed upon him, love him, serve him with all of our heart so that we can produce uh, and, and we are cleansed from dead works. If you have dead works in your life, get rid of them today. Don't wait for God to do it. God is waiting for you to do it. You walk away from that relationship. You walk away from that business deal. You do whatever you have to do to obey God. And you do it today, not when you're ready, not when it's convenient, not just on Sundays, but every day, every day. We are expected to fill our home. God gave you the heart. God cleansed it. He, he gave you the power through Jesus' name to reject those demonic spirits, those evil circumstances, those false memories, those things that happened to you as a child. You're no longer a child. You're not on the milk of the word. We're on the meat of the word. We are becoming more and more discipled every day. Studying God's word will change us. God's peace and grace for all of our hearts. Colossians Three. Now, I won't have time all day to get to all these descriptions, but let's go ahead and look at Colossians chapter 3 real quick. And I, I just want to verify, and this will help us to stay on track as we go. Colossians 3, verses 15 and 16. Ready? Here we go. Colossians 3, 15 and 16. And let the peace of God rule. Well, there is a peace of God. Maybe the peace we have is false. Maybe we have confidence in our money. Maybe we have confidence in this world system, but it's not. That's a false. We see right here. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called into one body, not many denominations, not many false teachers. We were called to one body, Christ born of a virgin birth, Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, Christ coming back for us, right? All these things are the sound doctrine. So where is it? It's the peace of God is in the heart, which were called into one body and to be thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom. If God has wisdom, so does the world. You want to believe in your science? You want to believe that you can be your own God? Follow that teaching and see where it ends up. But as a man of God, I can't let people stay there. I can't stay there. We're heading there sometimes, but we have to repent and turn from what the world is offering, what we've been caught up in. Just because you've been in error doesn't mean you have to stay there. Repent. Ask for God's direction, and he will give that. Let the, let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. Doesn't that sound good? God expects us to do that. 
Even God's law is to be written on our hearts. Again, we'll look over here quickly. Hebrews chapter 8. I think now as we turn to all these scriptures, you understand why I, a lot of times when I'm, I'm traveling, I like to have a lot of this out. Hebrews 8 and verse, verse 10. And we're going to move on here in just a second and get into some other points of what we're talking about today. How do you fill an evil heart? Number one, God gave you a heart. God helped you cleanse it when you were saved. But to be discipled, now you have to fill that heart up. And if you don't, sometimes you got to take the old stuff out to get the new stuff in, right? Have enough room. So let's look at this. For this, Hebrews 8.10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. For those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind. Some people will tell you the heart is also a part of the mind, and, and that's for another teaching. But again, the heart is the mind, and, writ, and written them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Where did he write it? He wrote it down in their hearts and in their mind. That's like these scriptures. They're good in this book, but if somebody comes and takes this book, what are my thoughts going to be pertaining to? I can meditate on the things of God. God can reveal a scripture to me that he wants me to memorize, study, walk out. You know, iron sharpens iron. And so we see that what happens to us when we don't fill our heart. Now, we talked about the dangers. We just went through the dangers of an empty heart. Evil, wicked, murderous, adulterous things come out of your heart. But Jesus said also good things can come out of your heart if you're willing and obedient to eat of the good fruit and to renew your mind and put things into your heart. Let's go on and look at. So when we don't fill our heart, remember, there's it's like, it's like a vacuum. The world is just a magnet and, and idolatry and all these kind of things that are unnatural and against the laws of physics. You were created to love and serve God. That's what we talk about in evangelizing. You have a hole in your heart. And the only thing that can fill that in your life is the things of God. And so put, put the word of God in your heart. Make every effort to fill your heart with good things and, and, and return to those things and reject those things that are not of God. And so it's up to you and I to fill that empty heart. Jesus will be with you. And when you put the things of Jesus in your heart, you will be blessed. You will have peace. He's written it on your mind. He's written it on your heart. He's given you the word of God, but he expects you to, to understand that craft. Be a craftsman. Be a child of God. Be a daughter of the Most High and grow thereby. And so we see this. Consider some of the example of the Corinthians. We'll, we'll look over here real quick at 1 Corinthians. And again, we'll have to move on for time. I have... Uh, no understanding of how, how long we have been, but we, we, we teach every week. Let's go over here to 1 Corinthians. Amen. As we get into 1 Corinthians, we want to look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. And it says this right here, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed. All right, let's find out what God says. God says you were washed. He says, you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And again, when you fall in love with the scriptures, you begin to see what he's doing. So you have been washed, you have been sanctified, you have been justified. That's why you can't just walk around and say, oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace and Whatever happens, happens. If God wants it to be different, he would do it. No, you take charge in love under authority. Amen. You don't just run out positive thinking, name it, claim it, and go after riches and identity. A lot of these people that teach that stuff aren't healed themselves. They're looking for answers, and God will judge them at, at that appropriate time. We are to serve our Heavenly Father with all of our heart. All right, let's look at this. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I know I keep talking about finding a stopping point, but I love turning. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's look at this right here. Verses 20 and 21. Ready? Here we go. 2 Corinthians 12, 20 and 21. For I fear least when I come, I shall not find 
you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbiting, whispering, conceit, and all the above. Least when I come to you again, my go my Lord, humble me among you, and I shall mourn, for many of you have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, the fornications, and the lawlessness which they have practiced. So Paul's writing to the church of Corinthians here, and he's telling them all these things are present in your life. Why? Because you have not filled your heart up, right? So we consider the examples of false teachers that mentored to Peter. So we're going to turn over real quick to the second book of Peter. And we're going to see a couple things here. And again, I want to stay on track. I uh, never want to do a, a two-part series or anything like that. But we're getting to some good stuff. Uh, second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 says this. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. That's what I'm saying, folks. Get involved. Be discipled. Know the word. Know Jesus. Have a relationship. There's powerful ministries and teachers out there that God will bring into your path. But you have to get rid of the, the, the counterfeits, the Ishmaels. You got to get to the Isaacs. Get into the to the bloodline of the Lord. Find men and women that raise you up, that love you, that serve together. Amen. Uh, teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring in on themselves swift destructions. We don't have to try to take down false teachers. They're taking their self down. And unfortunately, it's a lot easier to follow them sometimes than, than it is because you feel all good on the inside and bubbly, but you also need to you need to follow the teaching of God's God's pure word. Amen. The Lord brought them. The Lord allowed those false teachers in there, right? To buffet his children, to give his children discernment, to give his children uh, tenacity to stay there. He brought them by the Lord and escaped the pollution of the world through Jesus Christ. Second Peter uh, 2 and verse 20 says this, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are also inter uh, inter uh, in in entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse of them than the beginning. So we see right here, whether it's Paul talking to the church of Corinthians, whether it's Jesus casting out demonic spirits, he says the Lord desires to cleanse you, but it's up to you to fill that empty heart back up. And you have a choice. You have a free will. So the Holy Spirit is not going to make you go study the word or go to your prayer closet or to help you overcome. You're going to tear these things down in the power and the authority of the name. But there's things that we have to do. So they've been coming and tangled again. They went back to their old ways and you will go back to your old programming of your childhood, negative thoughts over your life. If you don't put on the helmet of salvation and reject negative thoughts and put the thoughts of God's word into your mind. And a lot of people do return back to their evil intentions, their evil way, and they get ensnared, entangled, or entertained. The word entangled means, actually, if you translate it back, to be ensnared, to be trapped. And that's why people get hooked on their phones and their devices and their TV. Why? Because the devil has them looking for something that, that there's no end to. He puts them in bondage and enslavement. Uh, 2 Peter 2, uh, verse again, 20 and 21. We'll read a little bit more. We just read uh, 20, but let's read 21. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness and having known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered to them. So, you know, are you in the gray area? Are you in neutral? Or you know you're saved, but you're not growing and you're living for self? We need to live for Jesus, and we, we need to work out our own salvation. And, and can somebody lose their salvation? Once saved, always saved. I mean, it gets into all kinds of stuff, but keep it simple. At Cowboys, we just need to know what we need to do, right? And we need to follow Jesus. We need to have a covenant with him. We need to bear his principles and, and apply and sow and work and labor in the fields and 
it's all about bringing people into the kingdom of God, just like these messages. And so that's what we're doing. We're looking at these things right here. How do things become worse if uh, worse than first? Well, we see forsaken the right away. Second uh, Peter two fifteen. We'll stay right here in the same chapter. Second Peter two fifteen says this: Then they forsaken. Then they they have forsaken the right way and gone astray. There's a right way out there, riding on course with your heavenly father. There's a way that's really popular that everybody's following these teachers, but they're presenting a different Jesus. And it's really fun to be a part of everybody. You know, the big social gatherings, but where is Jesus in that? Sometimes he's not present, but they're using his name to draw it in. And so we see right here, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Baal, the son of bore who love the wages of unrighteousness the world and the flesh loves to be unrestrained but god says if you can't overcome the flesh you're of no value to his kingdom his army we must battle spiritually prayer faith obedience to his covenant knowing him in a relationship he's available to you to take down your giant but you got to know that your giant isn't uh, more powerful than the one that is on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So it's up to you. Choose you this day what you want. So that's how they can be worse, right? Eyes full of adultery, hearts tainted with covetousness, right? Everybody wants to have what their neighbor has, right? That's the breaking of the commandments. Are we old-fashioned to believe in the commandments? Are we old-fashioned to believe in the Constitution, you have to choose what you want to believe in, but there's only so much room. And God says, I've washed you with the word and written my laws on the tablets of your mind and your heart. Will you obey them? I can't obey them for you, brothers and sisters. You have to do it. I have to do it. We have to dedicate our homes. We have to dedicate our resources to the things of God. And, and we do that. Let's go on. So even they denied the Lord uh, and the Lord brought them. In our case, let's look at this. Remember, our hearts have become Harden Hebrews 3. Let's look at a couple more scriptures here. You guys let me know or, or chime in. I, I can go on all day. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Hebrews 3, right here, 12 and 13. He says, right here, he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you of an evil heart. You encounter people every day that have evil hearts. What does he say? Hearts of unbelief in departing from the living God. All right, let's read verse 13 here. He says, but extort one another daily while it is still called today. Least any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So when we see these people that are deceived and have a hard heart, we need to love them, yes, but we need to have the ability to share a workman being ready to preach in season every moment share the gospel of the good news of God's love for them. So your heart will become hardened if you don't replenish it with the things of God. And we're seeing many scriptures today that will help us. Amen. Hebrews 10, 26 through 29. Can't turn there. We become so hardened through willful sin that we trample the son of God underfoot and count the blood of the covenant a common thing and insult the spirit of grace. Amen. We become hardened to the things of God. That ought not be. We should love God more than we love life ourselves. Our life has died that we should take up our cross because of what Jesus did. He died for me while I was yet a sinner. I owe him everything. And apart from him, I have nothing. How can I walk in pride? Many people have spiritual pride, earthly pride. Pride goes before the fall. Pride will bring destruction to your life. When we see it, we put it under the covers and we don't want to deal with it. So we follow all these popular teaching and sugarcoating. We go to the fellowships, but we never get to the core issue. God wants to speak to the very inner person that you are on the inside. And to do that, he may need to take you for 30, 60, 90 days to the wilderness, to a dark place where you're just him talking to you. And then you come up with purpose and then you fight and you're ready for the battle. 
I don't mean that God's going to put you in a dark place, but sometimes we go to a prayer closet early in the morning, watching between the hours of nine o'clock and two o'clock in the morning. What do we do? We're studying. Amen. We reach the point where it becomes impossible to be renewed again of repentance of where we were crucified, the son of God and putting him to open shame. That's Hebrews chapter six and verse four four through six. Again, I want to make sure this is a complete teaching, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. Hebrews six, four through six. I'm going to read it real quick. Stay with me. We're verifying that you and I have to fill our empty heart, but God gives us all things to do that. Hebrews six, verse four. It says, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gifts and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Amen. We're going to come into a new level of God's power. I'm excited. Are you excited? Let's get out there. Let's make sure our neighbors and our family are ready for what's fixing to come. Even before we hit the election of November, there are things to come. Let's be ready. Let's be excited. Let's be about the Father's business. Amen. Verse 6 of Hebrews 5 says this, uh, If they fall away to renew again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Amen. We see this. There's a there's a, there's a first part, and then there's a second part. There's a great apostasy, people falling away from the church, but there's going to be a great revival in this earth before the Lord comes. And even if he's judging America, you and I, brothers and sisters, can be so blessed. Do we have to endure and, and struggle through temptations and fires? Absolutely. Bring it on. For greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Put on the armor of God and battle that day. Don't just sit down and cower down and disobey by saying, well, I'll get around to what God wants me to do tomorrow. No, tomorrow's not as sure. He could come while this message is happening. And we need to be ready for him. Amen. So we go on and we just see here, we're talking about filling an empty heart. In such a case, how true to the statement, the last state of that man will be worse than the first state. Only you can take spiritual inventory of your heart. God and you. God sees it. God knows it. But are you going to come clean and repent? Confess hidden sin? Love him? Serve him? More than any popular thing, a covenant in this world and idolatry and chasing the golden calf and got to have this before I'm happy and wish God would do this. I'm waiting for God to do this. God's waiting on you to do his word. What we're talking about today, fill your heart with the things of God, setting your mind on the things above, right? Let's go on here. I'm trying to wrap this up. Um, how important is it then that we do not let the home of our heart remain empty and thus invite worldly things to take up the residence. Over the door of your house is the blood of Christ representing what he did for you. And Jesus said, what I'll do for you is I'll put the spirit of death past your home. You will not have plagues. You will not have disease. You will be blessed with resources. You will have your eyes enlightened to the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the world. So if you put the blood of Jesus over the door of your house, put it over the door of your heart and begin to fill it so that there's not room enough for the world. That way, the state of that man won't be worse than the beginning. Stay on course, brothers and sisters, to those things. Filling it up in principle. Sanctifying the Lord in your heart. First Peter, we got to continue to just look at a couple. First Peter, and we'll look at 3.15. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you uh, a reason for the hope that you have. Are you excited that Jesus lives and dwells in your heart? That you're filling your heart with the things of God and other people see it because they are without hope. They are unclean. They have been unwashed by the water of the word and through a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He says the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Meekness is power under control. Man, when you get a revelation of who God is living on the inside of you, you should be ready 
and, and ready to go. So what does the word sanctify mean? It means to be set apart. We are his chosen. We are true believers. We're not just bumper stickers, cross-wearing believers in a culture of the American church. No, we love God. We're willing to die for God. In fact, we have died in our current life so that we would take up the knowledge of God to follow him rather than following self. Self is a wicked thing. It is the flesh and the devil sets traps for you every day to follow your flesh, to follow the ways of the world, to give in to his science, to listen to a world report. But you got to listen to God's report, what he says. Amen. Set a special place in your heart as the rule for your life. We must regard Christ as holy in our hearts. God is holy, holy. We cry out to him for his to help us, to help our brothers and sisters going through fires, going through uh, conflict around the world. Pray for those that are truly searching. God loves all of his creation, but he doesn't force himself on those others. Amen. We must regard him holy. Be selective uh, to the things that you allow into your mind. Be selective. Watch what you watch. Watch what you read. Watch what you hear. Amen. Set your mind on the things above. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. You know it. Let the word of God dwell richly in your heart. Colossians 3, 16. Let it is a graceful thing. God says, let my word be about in everything in your life. Follow the example of David. Psalms 101. Real quick. And I'm going to have to at some point uh, not turn to all these, but let's look at Psalms 101 when we're talking about the example of King David. Psalms 101 verses 3 and 4 says this right here. Real quick, we're getting down to the final point of what I want to share with you this morning. Psalms 101 and we're going to read verses 3 and 4. He says, I, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who who fall away, I shall not clean, uh, it shall not cling to me, and preserve, preserve heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. King David knew who he was. He knew his purpose and his identity. He worshiped the Lord, and when he made mistakes, as we all do and have and will, we run to the mercy seat of God. We run to the throne. We repent. We turn from our ways. We don't just push it under the carpet, hoping that nobody else will find us out, right? So I'm saying we don't have to take down false teachers. They're already taking down themselves. They're not complete. They're empty in the heart, but they have everything looking good on the outside, right? Our world is going to come into a place where people need the gospel, the truth, and the purity of God's word. So we think upon those things that are wholesome, anything pure, just, and holy, meditate on these. Philippians 4.18, remember, transformation of character belongs with the renewing of the mind. Amen. Uh, not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may test and prove what is that acceptable, pleasing, and will of God. That's my scripture. That's the life scripture that God used to change my life. How do we fulfill it in practice? We take every opportunity to study God's word. Now, I'm not going to turn to all these scriptures, but we study God's word. Every opportunity, every opportunity, we're about the Father's business. Amen. Um, we attend services of, of faithful word-based churches. All right. We get involved in the church. We participate in Bible studies and prayer groups, and we read the word of God daily. Psalms chapter 1. Some of these are too good not to turn uh, to. Psalms 1 through 6. Let me read it real quick. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalms 1. We'll read, read the first six scriptures here. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sits in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and his law he meditates day and night he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaves shall not wither but whatever he does shall prosper the ungodly are not so see the first four verses three verses are for the believer it's for you and i listen to what he says to the unbeliever he says the ungodly are not so but they will be like chaff which 
when the wind dries, uh, dries and blows away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the seat of the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the ways of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. It's you and I's choice today to put God where he belongs. So how do we do this? How do we fill our heart? We let the word of God dwell richly in our hearts. We allow ourselves to be filled and full of his spirit. The Holy Spirit loves you. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. If you reject the Holy Spirit, you're rejecting the teaching of God's word. And he chastises those who he loves. He wants to minister to you today. His spirit, get alone with him and discern what that is. Amen. Uh, churches at home or in the car, you can sing, uh, turn on his worship music, all these types of things. Uh, let the mind of Christ dwell in you and be worthy of praise and virtue. I'm just skipping over these for time purposes. Be, excuse me, be selective about what you watch in TVs and movies and, and books that you read. You allow and open up the enemy to come into your heart and be suggestive to you. There's fiery darts that he throws to you and he begins to put question marks where God has exclamation points, right? Amen. A couple more things here. Choose your friends wisely. Bad company corrupts good character. And I promise you the friends that you give up in the world cannot be compared to the friends that God brings you in the body of Christ. God doesn't want you to be alone. God doesn't want you to try to do all these things on your own. He strengthens you. Iron sharpens iron. Do not forsake the assembly of the brothers, spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. You need to be together. And God will provide those people. And you'll know it because they edify your spirit. They bring you together. And they're talking about the things of God in its correct fashion. They're not cherry picking. They're not talking about how to have your better life all the time. They're not coming at you with another Jesus. Paul warned us of that in the church. And that's why the church is under judgment. Because they're not teaching the Jesus of the word. Amen. Let's go on here as we close down. We cannot have communion with darkness and expect the light of God to dwell in us. 2 Corinthians. We'll kind of close out with this. 2 Corinthians, and I believe chapter 6. Look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. Here we go. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says this. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? That doesn't mean that you're not involved in social outreach and you're there, but you are the light. You take Jesus in and whenever that gets out of hand, you retract, but you preach righteousness. You preach truth. You preach holiness. You're not just once saved, always saved. And, you know, just all these kind of things that float around out there and just hang around to be getting around, right? No, you love people. And, and you minister, you give food in the name of the Lord. You give a positive word of affirmation and love. You take care of the widows and the orphans. You provide hay to the rancher that's cows are on fire right now. You do everything, but you do it in the name of the Father, not in your name to look better. And, and as we do these things, and then great things. Let me just conclude this morning. I don't even know where my times are. Are you filling your heart? Or are you waiting God to do it? God said, I'll give you everything you need. I'll be with you in the fire. I'll be with you in the battle. Here's my word. Here's my Holy Spirit. Here's what I did for you. And if you don't know that, or if you're deceived and following another Jesus or all this hyper grace and all this religion, you won't know the power of God. Amen. When God comes back, he doesn't need to see us having Sunday school. He needs to see us pushing back on Satan, delivering our children, staying away from the plagues and engaging our community and our country. Because if we don't, who will? God can send legions of angels to pull them off of the cross, but he fulfilled the cross to pay the debt for our sins and our wickedness so that we can live and bring him back to this earth. 
He's watching in eclipses. He's watching in all these signs that we're going in. But the question is, are we awake and are we attentive? So are you feeling the things of your heart? If not, your heart will become abode for every evil thing. And the condition of your heart may become even seven times worse than it was before you even knew anything about Jesus or that you answered an altar call one day. That doesn't make you a Christian. Might get you saved. There's a robe of righteousness, but there's a gown of salvation, right? And the rewards of the life that we endure on this fallen earth, we will be credited at the time when we're united with him. But we can't allow all this deception and evil on this earth to shut down the voice of God's kingdom, God's good news, and who we are as believers of the true king that we follow. And that's what the world is doing. It's getting shorter, shorter. It used to be overseas. Now it's coming to our continent. Now it's coming over our borders. Now it's getting into our politics. Now it's getting into your local school. It's at your library telling stories to your children. We don't know if we're male and female. All these things are coming in. What are we going to do? Are we going to be standing there as a watchman saying, no, no, that's not who we are. That's not what we believe. That's not how we operate. And if we'll do that, God will be with us. So have you experienced initial cleansing of your heart? Maybe you've been saved, but you're not sanctified and discipled. I challenge you, brothers and sisters, fill your empty heart with the things of God. Have the mind of Christ. Be about the Father's business. Have you cleansed? Have you been cleansed and baptized in the blood of Christ? Study that out. It's so wonderful. But do not be deceived into thinking that you do not need to be consecrated about the feeling and the dwelling with the presence of God and all that is good. Now, why are we waiting? Arise and be baptized. Be washed away with your sins. And understand that the calling, we are all calling on the name of the Lord. And he has given you gifts and talents to serve him, to love him, to follow him, and to be victorious in life. Even though being victorious, you may go under all kinds of persecution, all kinds of deception. But don't cling and hang on to the evil and the darkness of this world and its agenda and the things that it's sending forth right now. Put up the shield of faith. Put on the full armor of God. Helmet of salvation. The belt of truth. The feet shod with the gospel of peace. The sword of the spirit. And go about spiritual battle. And being one who knows where we're at. And what God is trying to do in your life. I'm going to pray with you. That your heart is filled with the things of God. Will you pray with me? Father in the name of Jesus. I thank you for our partners and our friends. Lord take this teaching wherever you would have it minister to your children. Father God, be with our world. Help us to know in the signs of the times that we are living in, symbolically, you are speaking to us. You are judging. You are blessing. And Lord God, through all these things, let us be attentive and let us be prepared of truly knowing your son, Jesus, what he did, and the power that we have in that name, the power that we have over our flesh. And Lord, as we come together in unity, we'll call down heaven and earth and your word shall remain forever. And in those divine times, Lord, that we will be with you soon, help us to orchestrate the affairs of ministry and outreach and getting this message of the gospel to all four corners of this earth for your glory, that you may be glorified. Father, forgive us of our sins. Come into our heart and fill us with the Holy Spirit and lead our lives every day that we may ride on course with you. We pray these things and all of God's children said, amen and amen. Listen, I pray that this teaching has helped you. Again, I can't see any times or monitors today. If it's a little bit long, I do apologize, but share it with everybody that you love. And keep coming back as we study God's word each week together. I want to encourage you to partner with us. We may be in a community where you're at. You may come out and visit us, whatever has to happen. But remember, iron sharpens iron. Until next week, we love you here at Western Harvest Ministries. Right on course with your heavenly father. And know what you know and be firm to stand on your beliefs. Just make sure you're believing God at face value and love him with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And if you'll do that, you'll be renewed, and God will send you into the battlefield, 
and you will be rewarded with his love, with his peace, his long suffering, his joy, and all the eternal hope that we need to endure until he comes back for us. Listen, we love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week on Riding on Course. I'm Scott Mendes. Bye-bye.